I don't know how long ago it was that we were over in the little hall, but I do know this. Boy, it did my heart good to be in that prayer meeting. Do you want to know why? They were praying about the young lady speaking here tonight. Isn't that just wonderful? So it is. <laughs> but it was good to be in the prayer meeting because call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which I knew not. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I wonder really how many of us, whenever we were singing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, could there have been one said, because he lives, I don't know how I'm going to get through tomorrow. You see, I wonder where you are tonight, because we are in God's house and what a lovely house it is. But why did we come here? We came because there is a three times holy God and that three times holy God wants to meet with each one of us. And as we come into God's house, sometimes, sometimes we can play act. And what I mean by that is so you could maybe be crying all day and maybe put a bit of powder on your nose. I don't know what you're like, but I go like Rudolph whenever I start to cry. And we could have the most miserable day. And then we walk some, out into the house, out, out of the house, into the church, into a shop, and someone says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. But you see, God does not want you to be like that tonight. God says, just be still and know that I am God. God says, I know the way that you take. And when you are tried, he says he's going to bring you forth as gold. God says, be still and know that I am God. Just for a few minutes, we can just be real in his presence. It's okay to take our false faces off and just be real because he is a high priest that is touched by the way the feelings are for infirmities. And you know, there is a lovely wee verse of scripture and it's found in Isaiah 61 verse 1. And it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Are you brokenhearted tonight? And yet the spirit has come to bind up your broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And I wonder tonight, is someone bound in sin? I wonder if someone shackled. Sometimes, as you will hear my testimony, I had many open sins, open sins that the world could see. But perhaps there's one sitting even in our midst and that you have hidden sins. And Jesus says, come to me and I will set you free. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you life and I will give it to you more abundantly. He says, I will meet you at the point of your need. But he just wants us to be still. Just be still and know that he is God. No play acting. It's okay to be real. Just cast your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. I wasn't born into a Christian home, but, and I really can't remember a lot about this apart from this. Whenever I was about three, my daddy got saved. Now, how can I remember that? Well, I remember around that age that it was my very first memories of going to children's meetings. Now, I like to think that it was because my father was really just looking at me to hear the word, and I do know that that is why he sent me out to hear the word. It would never have been just to get rid of me for a wee while, so it wouldn't. Could you ever imagine that? <laughs> But whenever my daddy got saved, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. My father used to be a barman and God closed that door because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It was at the end of my first year in Sunday school and there was this little old man, well, he looked old to me then, and his name was Theodore Dancing Smith. And I do not know what he really spoke about that day. I cannot remember that. But I remember after that meeting that my sister in our church in Banbridge, my sister, she was speaking to him. Now, I wouldn't want you to think that I was nosy. <laughs> but off I went over to see what, what she was talking to him about. And he was telling her the way of salvation. And you know, it hasn't changed all these years later. It's about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And as a little girl, some people say that children can't get saved. That's a load of rubbish. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And as a little girl at the age of four, I knew that there was only one way into heaven. And maybe you have heard, the, well, sort of the beginning of my testimony. Maybe you've heard this story many, many times before. But I make no apology for it because it is my way, my story is not your story, your story is not my story. 
But this is my journey that began, and my journey as a Christian began on the 8th of June, 1975. Whenever I prayed that little prayer at the age of four, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. It has to be a personal prayer. You must be born again. And can I ask you that right at the very outset of this lovely meeting, are you born again? Do you know it's great to go to church, but I'm not asking you to go to church. I'm asking you, do you know, maybe you do not know a date, maybe you do not know what time it was on the clock, but do you know that you had an experience with God? Do you know that he forgave you for your sin? Do you know that he washed your sin in his precious blood? Do you know that he promised to take that sin and never to remember it again? Do you know that you're blood-bought and blood-washed and on your way to heaven? And yet, if there was a little question mark in any of those questions that I asked, Tonight, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, and you can know that tonight. And I suppose as a wee girl, it was really easy to walk with God. Her brother asked me in the way in the door, he says, are you the singer? Well, I don't know about that, about me being a singer, but I do remember many or a few years ago, I was driving along in the car, and my father was really, really ill at this time, and he was singing that song, He Leadeth Me, He Leadeth Me, by his dear hand, He Leadeth Me. Well, I thought I would bless the man, and I'm driving along, and I decided to sing, He Leadeth Me. And I can honestly say I sang that from the bottom of my my heart. And you know the little saying, pride goes before fall. Well, I actually thought to myself, Jeannie, you didn't sing that too badly. And I, in my heart, you didn't sing that too badly. And my daddy just looked at me like, he says, I wish a really good singer would sing that to me. <laughs> but you know, isn't it great to have a song in your heart? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Friend, can you sing that tonight, that the love of Jesus is something wonderful? Do you know him as your personal saviour? And as a wee girl, many times I used to sing for the Lord, used to testify for the Lord. Uh, times have changed. They used to get a box and put me in the back of a box. I'm not going to take them off, but thank God I've got the high heels on so as you can see me tonight. But then I went into high school, and whenever I went into high school, I can honestly say that I went in with good intentions. And yet there is a little saying here that far away fields look green. And we know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. My father bought me a little Jesus key, and it was back in the day of the V-neck jumpers. And I remember thinking, I am going to be a missionary for God. I am going to win my friends for Christ. And then, if you think that, if you're walking with God, you can be sure there's an enemy at your back. And his desire is to ransack our lives. He's a thief that comes to try and steal and kill and destroy. And yet, my brothers and sisters, God did not say that it would be easy to walk with him. He said, as it was prayed in the prayer meeting, there'd be a spiritual warfare. But the battle's already won because the battle is his. And if we are blood-bought, the enemy's desire is to get us away from Christ. And if we are not saved, well, he wants you to look at that, that window, and he wants you to look at your clock, and he wants you to think... And yet God says, whatever your circumstance in life, if you're not saved, come to me and I will give you life. If you are saved and you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, come and I will meet you at the point of my need, your need. And yet in my heart, I started to look at my friends. And instead of running to the book and getting my guidance from the book, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof for the ways of death. And my friends told me that there was a teenage disco going on. And you see, I never woke up one morning and said, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to backslide. It didn't happen that way. But there is a verse in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, and it says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, that cover with a covering but not of my spirit, that, may, that they may add sin to sin. Do you see, it started in my heart. I heard about the disco. I knew I wouldn't have been allowed to go because, you see, God's ways are perfect. And when he says, have no fellowship with them, fruitful works of darkness, that's to protect us children. We're not to be part of the world. We live in the world, but not to be part of the world. And I knew my father wouldn't allow me to go to that disco. And in my heart, I started to rebel. Woe to the rebellious children. And you know what the devil used with me? Well, that's your friend looking to go to that disco. And your friend's a Christian. And your daddy's just far too strict. And yet my father tried to do what God says, train up a child in his ways. In the way he shall go, when he is old, he shall not depart from it. But it started in my heart. And I thought, if I go to that disco, 
It'll be okay as long as my daddy didn't find out. And sin added to sin added to sin. Start it with the heart, then I'm in the disco. And then whenever I'm in the disco and I was asked to go outside, well, to tell you the truth, and there's no point telling lies, there was a few good-looking fellows looking to go outside as well, so I said, well, I'll go. And a bunch of my friends and I went outside. And whenever I was offered that first drink around the back of Bambridge swimming pool, sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. And young person, thank God you're here tonight. And Jesus loves you. But you have an enemy and you don't need me to tell you that because you know if you're saved, the struggles that you're having. You know when your friends are doing this and when they're taxing this and when they're looking at this, you know how hard it is to be different. And the devil says, come. And the devil says, play with me. And you know what the devil actually does? He gets you into his playground. And whenever he gets you into his playground, he'll kick the tripe out of you. And he'll just leave you ransacked. But sin will add to sin, will add to sin, will add to sin. And standing with that first drink in my hand, one little drink won't do you any harm. My friend, of course, I didn't know then, but I know now. And alcohol is a drug. The number one reason for healthcare problems in Northern Ireland is because of alcohol. And alcohol has no part. I, I personally believe alcohol has no part in a Christian's life. You take a little drink and it goes down your throat, it trickles down your food pipe, it causes cancer in your mouth, it causes cancer in your throat, it causes cancer in your food pipe, your heart starts racing, your blood pressure starts rising, it can bring on heart attacks, it causes ulcers in the stomach, and then it travels to your brain. And what does God say? God says we are to be of a sound mind. And when the alcohol travels to your brain, you're not of a sound mind. And I have to be honest, at the beginning, taking that first drink, I thought it was great. And yet God's word says there's pleasure in it. He didn't say there wasn't. He says there's pleasure in it, but it's only for a short time. He'll call you into his playground, and he'll kick the tripe out of you. And that was around the age of 13. But whenever I was 15, and actually this had happened whenever I was 14, I just didn't tell my parents until I was 15. I remember lying in my bedroom and I'm waiting on my dad coming in and because my mummy had just told him that I was already pregnant and sin would take me down a road that I never imagined I would walk. As a little girl, a sunbeam, a sunbeam was a song that I used to sing. But here I am at 15 and I'm pregnant. I had a little boy and then I left the family home at the age of 17. And maybe you know what I'm talking about because maybe you have a daughter in those circumstances. Or maybe you have a child and, and they have went the way of the world and maybe your heart is broke. And yet there is a beautiful wee verse, so there is. And it says, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. The seed of the righteous shall be delivered. And I don't know who did this, but someone in the maze prison, they painted a cartoon character on the side of a hanky. And then they put the lovely words, come unto me, all ye that labor. And are heavy laden and I will give thee rest. My friend, are you shackled by sin tonight? Maybe it's not an outward sin like my sin. Maybe it's an inward sin. And yet Jesus says, come. Come unto me and I will give you rest. Jesus says, I am touched by the feelings of your infirmities. Jesus says, I will set the prisoner free. Jesus says, I will give you life. I pinned that in the back of my door, but instead of running to him, I just kept running from him had that wee boy at 15, left the family home at 17. I never thought that I would be the mummy that would end up a drunkard. I never thought I would be the mummy to take the one, the little baby intercom after I had my second child out of wedlock and taking that little baby intercom and plugging it in and going to a neighbor's house and getting full drunk. I never thought that I would be the mummy to go to the school with the carry-out bags. As a little girl, Whenever I grow up, I'm going to be a missionary. But I went into the devil's playground. It started in re the rebellion in my heart. And sin added to sin, added to sin to 1995. And I am shackled and I am broken by the cure to this world. I was nothing but an old drunkard at this stage. And friend, I am not here to glorify the devil by telling you those sins in my life. But I do believe it's important. And why is that? Because maybe the devil would have you think, well, see all them Christians, they don't understand because they've never had a struggle. And that's not true. 
but we have a Savior that can deliver us. He can hold our hand and say, Fear not, I will help thee. He can set that prisoner free. 1995, broken, shattered, shackled, mess, kneeling at my city, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for who? Me. <laughs> Praise God, he cared for me. I remember praying that little prayer. I came to a crossroads in my life. So I did. Are you at a crossroads tonight? And the crossroads was, will I, will I go home? Will I turn around and get home to the cross? Or will I just keep going on the way of the world? And that wasn't easy, so it wasn't. Because as I was sitting in my line in my bed, it was like a tug of war. And maybe there's a tug of war going into your heart tonight. And maybe you know that you need saved, or maybe you know that you need restored, but the old devil said, do it tomorrow, or do it next week, or do it some other time. I remember there was a time that I stood in my, outside my back, and I had a beautiful cousin, and he put his arm around me, stood, and he put his left hand arm around me, and he said, Jeannie, I don't want you to worry about me. I will get saved. Do you see, the devil told him that he was a sinner. The devil told him he needed a savior, but the devil told him he had plenty of time. There was an invitation for a gospel meeting. It was actually our brother Gordy was having that gospel meeting. And it went through the door. It was in Banbridge, just as our other brother is having the mission in Banbridge at this present time. It went through the door on about, think about the Tuesday. And the truth was, whenever that gospel mission was to start on the Sunday, my cousin, who had an alcoholic problem as well, had climbed the steps in his home, stairs in his home, and he had fell back and he got, was in eternity by the time that gospel mission had started. Today, if you shall hear his voice, oh, my friend, harden not your heart. Well, how did I give up this booze? How did I turn around my life? How did I get from the gutter to walking with God? Well, honestly, I didn't do anything. It's not about me. It's all about him. Casting it all upon him, for he cares for you. The battle was not mine, but the battle was his. I remember praying that prayer, Lord, would you take me back? And I also remember praying, will you deliver me from this booze? Do you see, I was wise enough to know this, that I could not set myself free from that alcoholic addiction. And yet, what does it say in Isaiah 61? Opening of the prison to them that are bound. And that's almost 24 years ago. And just like that, God delivered me. And he came and he set this captive free. Do you know there are many, many times in my life I have been on the mountain on my Christian walk and there is many times I have been in the valley on my Christian walk. And this here is particularly for Christians tonight. And I'm going to round it off very soon, so I am. But I wonder are you in the valley tonight? I wonder, see, if person, brother, or sister, are you walking through the valley of the shadow of death? Is your heart broke tonight? Have you come in here feeling lonely? Has the enemy told you God didn't hear your cry? He hears the cries of his people. And sometimes when we cannot trace God's hand, we must just trust his heart. Sometimes when we cannot feel it, we just still have to believe it. Sometimes when the path seems so dark that we cannot see an inch in front of us, we need to just, if you're blood-bought and blood-washed, open up this book and read the promises of God and say, well, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. And it has been in the valley that God has taught me. He has taught me the goodness of him in the land of the living and the valleys of the shadow of death. You see, there is a little verse and this little verse is for every tried believer in this place tonight. It's found in Isaiah 45, verse 3. And it says, And I will give thee the treasures of darkness. I love that. Because you know what that tells me? That tells me, Jeannie, for every single darkness that you're going to go through in your life, I promise you, Jeannie, on the authority of my word, that I will have a treasure out of that darkness. Isn't that beautiful? We all like treasure, don't we? I never liked the darkness. I never liked the valleys. But God promises a treasure out of a darkness. Why? Because only God can take messes and make it messages. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. 
And whenever your valley is tonight, God wants to take that darkness and he wants to use it for good. I remember a time when I was going through a valley and it was a valley of sickness. It was the valley of sickness in our home. My father, he had became very, very ill. He was 64 years of age. He had a brain disease, so he had, he had dementia. And um, we just went from one mental hospital to another mental hospital. I remember hearing the news that he had a couple of days to live. And to be honest, in my heart, I was thinking, and I love my daddy, I was always this blue-eyed girl. But whenever I saw him, maybe you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death through sickness tonight. And maybe you're thinking, my God, why? And I remember thinking when I heard that, that my father had two days to live, I thought, well, thank you, God, because you're going to set him free. And there'd be no, really, Lord, there'd be no more pain. And Lord, I don't want there to be any more pain for him. And then what happened was those, that one day passed, and that two days passed, and that three days passed, and this doesn't make sense, because he couldn't speak, so he couldn't for a few weeks before he went into hospital. But then one Friday morning I went in, and just sitting here, and I want you to just picture it in your mind's eye, because we want to know that God's real. And we want, God wants you to know that he's right with you in this valley of darkness, wherever you are. And he wants you to know it even through the story that I would tell you now. And there's my father, and there's another man, and another man, and there was a priest here in this bed. And my daddy was sitting singing, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful he is to me. And he didn't die within those two days. And then he bowed his head. And whenever he bowed his head, and he was a wee frail man, he used to be over 20 stone. I don't know what a weight he was. He was wider than this pulpit. And I'm not, I love my daddy, but that's just the way he was. And now he was a wee frail man. So he was sitting in that chair. And he bowed his head. And whenever he bowed his head, he said, Our sufficiency is in the precious blood of Christ. And just like that, God opened my eyes. God spoke to me very clearly in that hospital and he says, Jeannie, I had to bring him this way because this is his mission field. And if I didn't bring him this way, these three gentlemen wouldn't have heard about the sufficiency only being in the blood of Christ. That illness went on for almost two years after that. Have you ever went home and taken the pill and put it over your head because you don't want your husband to hear you cry one more time. You don't want your children to hear you up what's in corner. And it was on the 25th of October that my daddy was promoted to glory, 2013. And a little while after that, I remember saying, Lord, what was all that about? And you know, I say that reverently, but I have a heavenly father. And reverently is my father. And I talk to him the way I would have talked to my earthly father, with reverence knowing that he is touched by the way that I feel and knowing that if I come to him, he's not going to cast me out and that he's going to hold my hand and that he is going to help me. And some days he gives me clear answers and some days I just have to trust. But it's okay to talk to him. In fact, he wants us to talk. He says, call and I will answer thee. And as I was praying, I said, Lord, what was that all about? And I opened up my daily reading and it said, blessed are the dead which die in the light in the Lord, Revelation 14. Why? Because they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And underneath it, or else it was above it, it was in the daily light, it says, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness. And just like that, God said to me, blessed was that illness that your father walked walked through. It was his labor, he's in glory, and his labors are going to follow them. I'm going to give you a treasure out of it, Gina. And I remember the word that came into my head then was Nadine. And I went to my son, and I said, Kyle, I really do believe that God's going to save Nadine, and it's going to be because of Daddy's death. Well, to cut a very long story short, the next morning, I lifted my phone as I woke up, and there was a little text message. And guess who it was from? Nadine. She did not know the verses God gave me. She did not know the conversation I had with my son. But this text message said, Jeannie, I just want to tell you that I got saved. You know the wee song, there's a new name written down in glory. Well, I did dance that around my house that day. So I did, because his works followed him into glory. I said to him, why, why, Nadine? Why did you do it? Because I knew what God had given me. And I wanted to see, was this really my treasure out of darkness? 
And she said, Jeannie, whenever I sat at your daddy's funeral that day for the very first time, I saw Jesus died for me. She's truly a treasure that came out of that darkness, the salvation of her soul, and now she's my daughter-in-law. I mend it now. He has brought me through the valley of shadow of death. He has taken me into an intensive care ward where I sat with my 15-year-old son on a life support machine because of illegal drugs. And today I say that one day, whenever I was sitting outside Mulla Villa Primary School, I'd wait say on corner, I says, God, I need you to speak to me. And I opened up the word because that's how he talks. He talks through his word. And he says, Jeannie, I have saw his ways and I will heal him. And you see, when he said that to me, I was thinking he's a drug addict. I go to bed at night and I pray, please, God, wake me up if he's going to end his life. And time and time again, just in the middle of the night, that's what happened. Just out of my sleep and down I went. And God had woke me up because that's exactly what was going to happen. And yet outside this school, God said to me, and sister, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. God's going to... I have saw his ways. I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. And I couldn't see it. But I took that word and I wrote that out. And every day, sometimes it felt like nearly all day. God, I can't see it. But you promised it. And you're not a God that you should lie. And you know what? God has set that prisoner free in the days a child of God's. So whether you're in the valley of the shadow of death, whether you've got a crisis in your life, save brother, save sister, God says, I will give you the treasure out of darkness, but you must cling to him. If you are not saved, today, today, if ye shall hear his voice, harden not your heart. My eldest son was on the clean side of the broad road, he sat in Lockbrook and Mission Hall one night, so he did. And God had very clearly, and there's a whole story to this, how I can tell you how God had very clearly showed me that that was the last chance that he was given. There's two roads. the clean side, the, or There's the road to heaven, and then there's the road to hell. But on the road to hell, some people say there's a clean side and a dirty side. There's not, there's just one road. But the drug addict of my son, he thought he knew he was on the dirty side. Do you see my other son? He preached to the country, but he was still on the same road. God told me that night in that meeting, very clearly, I asked him to show me one thing if it was Kyle's final chance, and he showed it to me. And at that meeting, I wept, thinking, if he does not come through for God tonight, this is it. Got up and walked out. Gordy Forster was with him. And whenever he got to the bottom of the steps, praise God, he turned and he came back in and he gave his life to God. Friend, today if you hear his voice, my son had his final chance and he gave his heart to God and he's walking with God and he made the right choice. My cousin had the final chance with invitation and to my knowledge, well to my knowledge and he's in a lost eternity. If you hear his voice, Harden not your heart. Thank you.